say my rights have been violated. You compare it to the Bill of Rights, it is one of the sections in the Bill of Rights, and that's where the Legal Services Unit will kick in. Importantly, it's not only when there is a violation, there's also a threat of a violation. So when we receive complaints, you don't have to say, well, only come here when your rights have been violated. There's also a possibility that if you fear that your rights will be violated, you can come to the Commission and then the Commission will deal with it. Million dollar question, how does the Commission deal with complaints? You know, what do we do? We have specific powers which when it's, it's given to us in terms of our constitutional mandate, but unpacked in a little bit more detail in our empowering legislation. That's the South African Human Rights Commission Act. You can go Google it, you will find it, it will give you all the details in it, but to highlight the portions which are relevant for us as the Legal Services Unit, it will be some of the powers that the chairperson has highlighted that other institutions, organizations do not have. For example, if we are in a position where we feel that we have a respondent who's not engaging with us, not assisting us in trying to resolve a complaint, that's really weird. Oops. Is it? Oh my goodness, who's coming in from the provinces? I can. Thank you, Tandeli. Um, there that's we are, strange. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't time it. Um, so we do have the power then to make use of uh, a subpoena notice, right? Where we can actually call on somebody to come to the commission and actually provide us with information. Very strong powers. It's not powers that you should use lightly. But clearly in the right kind of situations where violations are taking place, it, you, may, you may need to make use of that power. It's important to also note that we have the power to search and seize. Again, certain legislative requirements in order to do so. I can't wake up today and say, I'd like to go to somebody's house and see what's inside. That's not the right approach. There is a process that you need to go through. But we have the power to search and seize when there is a case for it. Right? Um, the chair mentioned very eloquently, better than I can, the powers that the Commission has to actually institute proceedings. So we can do so in our own name, in a court of law, but we can do so also on, the, on behalf of complainants. Um, we can also do so on behalf of organisations, a group of individuals. Our powers to be able to institute proceedings are very broad. Um, I don't know if you've done any sort of comparative analysis, other national human rights institutions have the powers to do so as well, some don't. The Commission in South Africa actually does have the power to institute proceedings, which is actually quite a strong power to have as a, as a national human rights institution. How, what do we do when we do our work? Uh, beyond what I've given you, which is the, the kind of detail. So when we investigate and we deal with complaints, clearly we have the powers to be able to do so through the correspondence, exchanging allegation letters to say here's the allegations that we've been um, given by a particular complainant. How do we then secure appropriate redress when you have an individual who's not going to be responding to you? Importantly, we don't have the power to make executable findings and recommendations. So when we're done and we find that there is a violation, we make our findings and recommendations. They cannot be ignored, they cannot be disregarded, but they don't carry the weight of a court order. Right? And we have to face in the challenges of what do you do then, which is why I've mentioned the power that we do have, and thankfully it is in place, to then institute proceedings. And that's where we will kick in that process, which is obviously where you can have a court give you an executable order that says if there was a violation, you now need to comply with whatever that court order says. We have other mechanisms, and I'm going to use the mechanism now or the opportunity to express what those mechanisms are, which I think um, puts us in a position to try and resolve disputes and complaints more amicably. That's the importance of making use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. When you use the adversarial mechanisms, you don't, what you do get is an opportunity for court to force you, for example, to apologize, right? force you to pay a monetary award. Right? Are we in a, does that then mean that that person has gone through uh, a process of understanding that there was a violation that that shouldn't have taken place? Not necessarily. Through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, we find that we, if, we, if we use that as a particular focus of our endeavors, that you go to, if you have, a, if you have the right skill set, the right opportunities, parties are willing to engage, you get a lasting solution. 
which is why we also direct our colleagues to make use of those alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to try and resolve complaints and not just immediately jump to the more adversarial course of action. We have also mechanisms in place, and that's how we also use our subpoena hearing processes, subpoena notice processes, is to, when we identify systemic complaints, so for example, it's not just one or two isolated incidents, but we're picking out quite a number of incidents where those violations are taking place. The chairperson mentioned racism in social media, where we're receiving quite a lot of complaints recently relating to people using racial epithets, um, derogatory remarks on Facebook, Twitter, the usual social media pages. What do we then do if we're finding that this is a systemic challenge? So as opposed to dealing with those cases in isolation, which we still do, we still pursue those individual complaints, we may need to host a hearing where we call on respondents to talk to us at a very broad level. Talk to us at a broad level where they may have a broader responsibility beyond the particular complaint itself. And there we can also produce findings and recommendations once we finalize a report, which is not only communicated to the parties and the public at large, but also to relevant portfolio committees. I'm now looking across to know, okay, so portfolio committees in Parliament, so we, we, we are also held accountable to Parliament, where we have to report to them on an annual basis. But there are relevant portfolio committees who have a specific subject matter that they're responsible for, where we can engage with those portfolio committees, where as the Commission can hold the executive accountable, so does the portfolio committee. So if we find against a particular department, a particular respondent, which is a state party, we engage with them to then also make sure that there's a level of implementation of our findings and recommendations. Um, I don't know whether you want me to bore you with the details about our statistics and just give a very brief demonstration. Okay, so I'm looking at that mm -hmm. and I'm going to milk it for all its 